I represent the pharmaceutical, the generic pharma industry, and I know there are a few here from across the aisle, so I welcome them. The question for Dr. Leinberger is, what precludes FDA from requiring innovative companies in disclosing the specific grades of excipient on RLD labeling? Okay, and I don't know, was that anything pertinent to the, the discussions here, or should we hold that to the final panel at the end of tomorrow? I guess uh, Dr. Ombia had alluded to something related to specific grades of excipients. Okay. That's what since, since you directed your question at Dr. Lionberger, he will be back at the panel at the end of tomorrow, so those broader questions we're going to, to hold for that. We'll try to keep these specific to what was discussed. Microphone number one, if you could step up nice and close, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Babskin. Um, that was a very interesting talk, and I, I recognize that the focus of your talk was on topical administration, but you emphasized viscosity multiple times, and I'm wondering if that also extends for intravitreal administration. Um, I've not directly tested that. I mean, I, I imagine that you're applying that into a um, sort of aqueous compartment that could play a role, but. Um, so it certainly is something that's testable within these platforms. Okay. Microphone number two, nice close for me, please. First, thank you all for the nice presentations. So my question is for Dr. Kozak. Uh, it's regarding the BEV rule for ophthalmic products. So in the guidance, it's pretty clear for simple solution, Q1, Q2 is a bio -wavel. But my question is, uh, it's still a simple solution but it's not a Q1, Q2. Uh, let's say there was additional like antioxidant or different buffer agent. Will that still be considered as a bioweaver? So <clears throat> I think it's, it's a good question in terms of um, uh, what would be permissible in terms of how you can change the formulation. I think as I spoke in my talk that there's still a, there's permissible excipient changes that are, are, are allowable. But the ability to how those different excipient changes affect the overall bioavailability of the drug product may not best be directly known. So that might not be bioequivalence not considered uh, self-evident. So in general, the current recommendations for any change in the formulation is not Q1, Q2, but permissible would be that you demonstrate an in vivo sort of study to demonstrate the bioequivalence of the drug product. Or if you have sufficient information or justification that that product should be bioequivalent and a body of evidence to support that, then I think that would be uh, acceptable as in terms of a pre-NDA meeting where that we can discuss it specifically and what type of information would be able to bridge. But just based on broad, any type of formulation change, because it's not known how it affects the bioavailability, would probably necessarily require an in vivo study to help support that equivalence. Okay. Thank you so much for the clarification. <laughs> And online question for me, please. Uh, this is for Dr. Kozak. For many formulations, clinical studies are required, but in a few formulations, the clinical requirements were replaced by in vitro requirements. What kind of analytical parameters uh, do you expect to see for the establishment of sameness? So I think as we, we spoke about, it, it's, it's you need to identify the critical quality attributes of that drug product. So going through and looking at how the different sort of uh, formulation aspects are potentially affected by the manufacturing conditions, and then identifying those, and then assessing that as the same as the criteria. That's how I generally go, would suggest going through that. Okay. Microphone number two, nice and close for me. Um, there's been, there was some discussion about stability uh, of various uh, types. But not a lot was mentioned about accelerated stability. And I know that for uh, ophthalmic emulsions and uh, solution or suspensions, rather, that's a destructive test. So does the FDA have any thoughts uh, on that? Or is it kind of too soon to ask a work in progress or any of the above? About the stability conditions, the ICH uh, Q1A document does provide the, the stability conditions that the product should be uh, put through, and accelerated condition is one of those conditions. 
Yeah, except when you have an emulsion, for instance, or a suspension. Right. You're going to irreversibly change the formulation. And so you can do it for a chemical stability, but you cannot do it for a physical stability. So I guess the question is, is this being, uh, I haven't really seen anything that directly addresses it, or is this sort of no. still being up for grabs? As far as the stability testing for the final stability testing for the drug product or registration, we still expect accelerated stability to be a part of, of the studies that's performed. Okay, and that would include physical stability? Uh, both physical and chemical um, testing of your product, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, and if you have any questions in the room, come on up to the mic. Another online question for me, please. This is directed to Dr. Onimba. For a USP grade excipient, is it necessary to provide the manufacturer name and address in the ANDA? For all excipients, we expect that you will provide the manufacturer's or the supplier's name um, and address for the excipient as, as well as the excipient um, lot or batch number. All right, another online question. It's for Dr. Babiskin. How close or reliable are the results from PK simulation models? In the future, can these be used as an alternative to in vivo in vitro studies. Sorry, can you repeat the question? How close or reliable are the results from PK simulation models? In the future, can these be used as an alternative to in vivo in vitro studies? All right, well, that's a very, very general question. So I'm going to only address the ocular PBK aspects of that question. Um, in terms of, in, the final part of the question is about the regulatory applicability of using these type of models to support not conducting these in vivo studies. Um, at this point, you know, we'll continue doing what OJ has been doing in terms of the in vitro recommendations. But uh, at this point, as I mentioned in the talk, there's a, still a lot to bridge before we get to the human predictions. Even just in some internal work that we've done in trying to use the different platforms and see if we can predict uh, the human PK. Uh, we have not been successful, especially when extra trying to extrapolate first and rabbit up to human. That's been our experience. Um, that's why we're still sponsoring additional, or still continuing to fund work in the ocular PVK arena to help improve these models and hopefully get there. Um, but that, I think that's, I would say that's the current status. All right. And if there are any questions in the room, come on up to the microphone. Next online question, please. This is addressed to Dr. Kozak. What are the criteria for assessing the viscosity, i.e., shear rate, range, temperature, for BE for the BE purpose? Uh, so that's a. I mean, it's a definitely a very good question. So within, if it's a Newtonian or non-Newtonian fluid, that should be definitely the first thing that you assess. And if it's Newtonian, I think a single point uh, viscosity measure can be done. If it's a non-Newtonian fluid, then what you should do is give a representation of what the uh, shear profile looks like over a wide shear range, and then compare that then to the reference product. There's not a specific range that necessarily would have to be defined. It's you're getting a profile and showing that your drug product has a similar profile to the reference product. Enough data to be able to then match those two. I wouldn't be expecting any sort of great difference that would go outside that. Now, if there's a thing like a shear stress or a yield stress, obviously you'd want to make sure to capture that for things like gels. So you'd have to have been able to assess your formulation in that way and then make the measurements appropriately. Okay, microphone number one, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. My question is for Dr. Baskin. Um, in your presentation, you referenced the external uh, parties that helped to create the PBPK models. And I was wondering if you would be able to speak to um, the agency's overall interaction and collaboration with uh, the developers of this PBPK technology. Is there any kind of um, like lateral collaboration? Or I'm just curious. Um, can you describe lateral collaboration? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, in terms of the technology developers consulting with the agency and the agency consulting with the technology developer. All right, so 
I'll speak to the two grants that we awarded. And we, we do this under a U01 grant mechanism, which is a collaborative grant. Um, but it's still a grant. We you know, submit proposal, and we eventually award it based upon meeting of our RFA. But we don't direct these studies. You know, they, they have their own proposal, what they're trying to achieve. And, but we, it's a collaborative. We're there to provide advice, because eventually we want these to be able to be applied in the regulatory setting. So we always try to keep that focus as we go through. Because um, within the grant mechanism, these developers can have their own collaborations on the side that may not be necessarily part of the grant, but certainly they're allowed to work with who they work with. So, yeah. Thank you. Right. Online question, please. This question from Dr. Anemba. What is the basis for OPQ's request for extremely tight impurity limits for ophthalmics considering the microliter doses delivered and the extremely short dwell time on the cornea? Question, please. What is the basis for OPQ's request for extremely tight impurity limits for ophthalmics considering the microliter doses delivered and their extremely short dwell time on the cornea? So for ophthalmic products, as I mentioned um, during my presentation, given the sensitivity of the eye um, and not knowing if a certain limit for the impurity would cause irritation uh, to the eye, not just safety, um, we recommend that you compare the limit to that of the RLD because we know the level in the RLD is safe and does not cause irritation for the patient. So as long as you're similar to the RLD, the levels in the RLD, um, that should be okay. All right. Another online question, please. This is for Dr. Babiskin. If the OCAT model has Sinom in vivo data as the input, how can this model be used for IV, IVC using rabbit data? which is what is available for the majority of ophthalmic products. All right, I missed the beginning part of that question, so you can repeat it again, please. If the OCAT or OCAT model yeah. has Sino and Vivo data as the it's, end. What's, sorry, what's that word? Has Sino? C-Y-N-O is how it's spelled. CYNO, okay. I can continue the rest of the question. I just didn't get that word before. Okay. <laughs> I'll start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> if the OCAT model has CYNO and VIVO data as the input, how can this model be used for IVA, IVC using the rabbit data, which is what is available for the majority of ophthalmic products? I mean, that, that speaks to. Um, a previous response I just gave in that in order to use that in the IVIVC scenario, we really have to have confidence that what's being predicted in the rabbit can be extrapolated to the human. And, you know, it's, you know, rabbits are used because their eye physiology is pretty close to humans, but there is a lot of things that are different. And, you know, in the, the principle of PEVK is that hopefully just by altering the difference between the anatomy and physiology between species that you can get accurate predictions. But even for the more developed areas, such as in the oral PPK area, uh, the species species predictions isn't always accurate. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done in, in the ocular realm. Um, we're, we're trying to do some of that work and try to see if we can establish such IV IVCs and, and actually with human predictions. And if we do that, we'll publish that information. But there's, there's a challenge there. All righty. Microphone number one. Nice close forward. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that last question. So it was interesting that you mentioned during your talk that rabbit data doesn't necessarily extrapolate to human. But now we're discussing the inclusion of the cinemologous monkey in the model. So does the monkey extrapolate better than the rabbit in these cases? 
Which I can't answer that question. Um, just because that's a level of detail um, that, I'm, that I'm not familiar with. But we, but we have people that can probably answer that question. Perhaps follow up. Yeah. All right. Another online question, please. This question is for Dr. Kozak. Can in vitro only can the in vitro only option based on the sameness of physic physicochemical properties be utilized for BE of the ophthalmic gel products too? If I understand your question correctly, uh, it's not simply for like suspension of motion of the other complex. You're asking if they can also be used for gels and other sort of like thick um, ointments for products or something, I guess. So in that aspect, um, yeah, uh, in general, an in vitro approach can be proposed um, for any ophthalmic topical drug product. Um, we develop guidances as where current knowledge becomes more available for all these products. But at any one time, uh, if an uh, industry has a proposal for such a product in their proposal for the in vitro approach and sufficient justification information that that is sufficient to demonstrate bioequivalence, they can definitely submit that information for any of the products. And then we can have a conversation about that and figure out what the most appropriate approach would be. OK, and let's wrap up with one more online question, please. This was for Dr. Anemba. For, dissolu for dissolution app IV testing, does the agency have recommendations for acceptance criteria for the number of criteria points and percent cumulative release? Testing, unfortunately, is um, reviewed by our biopharmaceutics group. And I don't think we have a biopharmaceutics person here. so. I think that question can be perhaps answered tomorrow. Tomorrow. At the end of the panel. Okay, and, and that that actually is a a, a very good segue to, to wrap up. Uh, tomorrow <clears throat> there is a special panel at the very end of the day where we'll have some experts that may be able to address questions uh, that were a bit more detailed than what we uh, got into today. But it'll be questions germane to the complex generics talk that we're covering. It's not going to expand beyond that into the larger uh, plans for OGD and things. Before we wrap up here, based on any of the questions you got, anything you heard, any final thoughts before we wrap things up? Yeah. Actually, I just have one final thought. I was hoping to get a question where I could respond in this way. Um, we talked a lot of questions today, and we always sit in a lot of other situations where we said, submit a preanda meaning quest. If you're planning to use a model to support this novel approach, especially in these areas which are so new, I encourage you to submit a pre-ANDA product development meeting request. We'd be more than happy to engage with you in these type of issues. Excellent. With that, please help me thank our panel for coming and talking to us today. Two bits of housekeeping. If you'd like to continue networking with folks, building for the base.